guys. Welcome to episode 19 of San Sharati Talks. It's been a while, but it's all good. You know me, sometimes I live in a cave and then I come out and connect with people. I'm at the wonderful ISC in Barcelona. It is a beautiful day here. I'm loving it. Um, this is a, a podcast, a San Sharati Talks podcast in partnership with the fantastic ISE. Um, if you're listening to this and you want to share, please put in the hashtag ISE22. Cool. All right. Well, look, we have got one of the coolest people in the world here. She is a, a very good friend of mine. She's one of my peers. She's in the circle of influence that I work in. She's a musician. She is a tech entrepreneur. She's just like really cool. Um, and I'm so happy to finally get you on the podcast. Please welcome to the stage, the wonderful Shama Rahman. Hello, hello, hello. Absolutely wonderful to be here with you. Um, trekking through Barcelona and uh, yeah, being here in this amazing well, the Integrated Systems Europe Conference. That's what it is. Mm. Yeah. So those of you listening, if you don't know what ISC is, that's what it is. And it's, it's basically um, an event where um, all suppliers of, of kind of visual technology, audio visual technology, um, basically like showcase all of their stuff. So you've got yeah. like screens, projectors, you've got all sorts of things. Um, and it's, it's really cool. It's very kind of serious, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, which, which is kind of funny because, um, Shama and I are here and we're not serious at all. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, we're like, what are we doing here? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's a really, really cool thing. And, and it's, it's wonderful that we're in Barcelona, sunny Barcelona. The event used to be in Amsterdam, but now it's, they've moved it to Barcelona. Um, and I love Amsterdam, but I actually like Barcelona better. Sorry yeah. guys. Yeah. Sorry, sorry about that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it's the sun. It's the sun. <laughs> Um, so, uh, Shama, there's going to be people that are listening to this who don't know who you are. Okay. Give us a brief intro about who you are and what you're about. Yeah, sure. Um, so you mentioned I was an artist. I uh, play the sitar and I like taking it out of its classical zone into areas like jazz, um, hip hop, drum and bass even. Wow. Um, and basically um, I sing, I'm a composer and band leader. So that's the sort of music I like doing um, with, with my own stuff and yep. compose with, um, with, with a little bit of electronics thrown in there. Um, and yeah, apart from that, you know, composer and um, for hire, even for podcasts. So <laughs> there you go. Um, and uh, I am a scientist as well. So I did, a, I did a PhD in the neuroscience and complex systems of creativity and innovation, which is wow. a bit of a mouthful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, essentially I was interested um, in consciousness. Um, and, you know, everybody knows it's a hard problem of consciousness. It's quite difficult to even think about what that is. And I thought, actually, creativity uh, is potentially something that is a manifestation of consciousness. Yep. Um, and it's something that we can all see and experience. And it's something, therefore, that I can, I can kind of explore from a scientific angle. Um, and my whole thing was, can I look at the brain whilst we are engaged in different stages of a creative process or different kinds of creative processes. So, of course, being a musician, I was like, cool, let's look at musicians. <laughs> so and, so how, yeah. how did you, um, like, because uh, it's a very interesting transition uh, mm. from being a creative, particularly within the music space. Yeah. What, what kind of led you into that world? Yeah, actually, weirdly, I was, you know, um, when I was a teenager, I was secretly practicing piano for about nine hours a day. I don't know why secretly, because I think somewhere <laughs> in my mind, I didn't realize that one could actually go and be an artist in a formal sort of a way. Yep. I didn't know there was such a thing as like conservatoires or, you know, music colleges or anything like that. So I was like, you know, as a, as a good Asian person being led towards either law, <laughs> medicine or science. I right? know what that feeling's like. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I was like, cool, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll do the science bit. That, that looks the most interesting. And yep. um, I ended up doing like, you know, like a pretty formal like scientific degree sort of pathway um, and then came this sort of you know crossroads if you will I'd finished my master's and I was like oh I really you know I can't you know suppress this music thing any longer but I also didn't want to choose so I was like hmm what if I just came up with my own idea and yep. look at music 
through the lens of science and kind of, yeah, merged the two together and went and proposed it to a bunch of people. And weirdly, they said yes. Um, and, you know, I was at Imperial College, uh, um, you know, really serious yet again, uh, in the Institute for Mathematics, um, essentially looking at uh, brain patterns, which I was actually then collecting from Goldsmiths, which is, a, you know, the wacky sister, <laughs> in a sense, um, within the computation culture and creativity space. Uh, it actually has like a weird, wacky, you know, metallic sculpture on the building as well, just to show how wacky it is. Yep. Um, and yeah, and then had advisors from, you know, all the music colleges basically. And, and there I was like, you know, doing something rather esoteric at the time. It was about 10 years ago. And now creativity is just sexy, right? Everybody wants to look at creativity. <laughs> it's always so. been sexy. Yeah, but it's more sexy. It's oh, like, man. you know, everybody wants to be creative, including people in suits, you know? Like, Absolutely. Yeah, well, I think it's um, the digitization of our culture because, um, you know, ev everything is getting uh, digitized, um, not just visuals, yeah. but like w what we do, like, uh, like, how we how we move as human beings now is digitized you know everyone has a smart device everyone you know if they, if they want to go to the doctors they have to kind of do it via a phone or an app or something like that yeah. or, or if someone's flying you know they're doing it through uh, like an application or mm. you know in, obviously in china everyone does everything through uh oh. wechat oh right yeah you yeah, know yeah, like yeah, they yeah. book their holidays they book their flights <laughs> everything um, wow and it's so it's, um, and the problem with that digitization even though it, it has utility and it's useful and everyone um you know uh, benefits from it it kind of uh takes away from how we explore things around us as humans yeah. and creativity is yeah. is the way to do that yeah you know? absolutely um it's great for mental health it's good for um you know just helping you move from from a to b i've i've noticed you know now that i'm getting an old becoming an old man <laughs> I've noticed hardly, that I've, hardly. <laughs> but I'm starting <laughs> yeah. to suffer from like short term memory loss. Oh man. And it's only through like, um, yeah. so I started playing guitar again yeah. and that's really helping me with my memory. Yeah, and yeah, it, yeah, like yeah. a lot of people don't realize just how important creativity is. Yeah. Them, it's actually really behavior. good for working memory. I remember like when I was first starting out on the sitar as well, I was just like, I could probably like, you know, I don't know if you know, but it's, it's very, uh, audio kind of a, a learning technique. You know, the teacher plays something, you play something back, yep. you know, and it's, it's not through like scores. So you have to kind of remember what they played in the first place. Why? Right. And I was just like, you know, maybe averaging six notes ago. And then by the end of it, I was like, yeah, I get the entire phrase. And that phrase might be like three minutes long. I was like, wow. whoa, whoa, I'm not sure I can do that anymore. But <laughs> <laughs> so it's quite a cool, like, training thing, I would say, music in itself. Absolutely. So let, let, yeah. let's go into the tangent of sitar. Yeah. So, like, how long have you been playing sitar for? Wow, now you're going to ask my age. Yeah. Like, huh? <laughs> okay. Only if you want to. <laughs> uh, oh, 17 years, wow. potentially. Okay, and how did you get into it? Um, okay, this one's going to sound really strange, but I had a dream. <laughs> Of course you did. Of course I did. Um, and yeah, and I woke up and I described, literally I did actually have a dream. I described this um, instrument to my mom and we were in Bangladesh at the time. I'd actually, I'd actually, you know, played other musical instruments before then, piano since I was like a kid sort of thing. So it's not unusual that I'm chatting about music to my mom. Um, but, it, you know, something that was unusual was... A, she went, oh yeah, that's a sitar, and here's a number for somebody that if you want to learn. And I was like, oh, what is a sitar? How did, what, what's going on here? And B, she was like, and I was a professional musician, which I didn't know until wow. I was like 20 or so. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so, so, she, cool. so she yeah. started to teach you sitar? Well, she is a singer, so she was teaching me some more of that sort of, you know, raga-based um, wow. music that's obviously from, you know, the... Asia part that we're both from, right? Yep. Um, and then she knew who kind of to direct me to, essentially. Um, and then she was like, oh, what's your favorite raga? I was like, oh, I think it's Iman. And she goes, so, mine too. <laughs> I was like, wow, what is this? Like, some sort of genetic raga memory. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then, so, um, you, you explored the sitar. That's, that's where you started to explore the sitar. Where did that take you as a musician? Because yeah. you've, you've, you've released like music and stuff using yeah, that platform. I have, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I guess, um, so I was, I was learning uh, from the Vilayat Khan style when I was in Bangladesh. And then when I came to England, I basically switched um, into the Ravi Shankar style because I was taught by the last senior disciple of um, Pandit Ravi Shankar, who's, who's uh, Pandit um, Sanjay Guha, uh, who's my wow. Guruji, right? And yeah, so it was really interesting to have, you know, already two kinds of, you know, as they call gharanas or house or say style yep. of playing. Um, and actually this one um, came down from the Maihar Grana, which is actually really flexible uh, in terms of it has multiple kinds of rhythms within it. Um, and, 
you know, therefore different kinds of sort of melodies and, you know, um, just versatile in a yep. sense. And then at the same time, you know, I've been doing classical piano for a very long time from the Western sort of canon. Um, and as soon as I came to England, because I was, I was in UAE before then, uh, for me, for some reason, the way to connect to England was through jazz, right. um, through radio yep. <laughs> and, you know, all the really cool sort of, you know, contemporary stuff that was coming out at the time, whether it was pop or like drum and bass or anything like that. And I I'd, I'd started by kind of like um, being a promoter of music, actually, when I was at university. So I was like the head of marketing for like the radio station no one's heard of now, which is apparently at the time was uh, Europe's largest digital radio station, not anymore. But yeah, it's wow. called Rare FM. So, you know, the whole thing was like, how can we like, you know, bring students and like well-known people from the you know, music scene together in like really cool venues like Madame Jojo's and places like that. And yeah, drum and bass, jazz, all of that. So, you know, at some point I was like, actually, I'm doing this stuff, you know, not just promoting it. And yep. um, in a weird way, the sitar kind of became my voice, like, you know, a second voice, yeah, but like uh, to, to maybe explore it, it became really like natural to take improvisation in that direction. And one day, um, there was, I guess, a person from industry who came to like, you know, watch one of our launches. And he's like, you know what? you should apply for like, you know, um, this, this sort of, uh, emerging composer scheme that's run by the, the, the jazz, um, London jazz festival people call Sirius, uh, because you're playing sitar jazz or jazz sitar. I was like, okay, that's it. That's a soundbite. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and yeah, that, that's where it's gone. So, you know, I've gone and done two albums with this band set up and, and a third album, which is more of a collaborative, um, Efforts with musicians from all across Europe, um, again, utilizing this sort of sound, jazz uh, within sort of, well, sorry, sitar within the context of jazz and a band setup. So like, you know, um, drums, guitar, um, bass, and then saxophone and electronics. So with that sort of sound world. Yeah. Um, and that was called Shaman Friends. And we were actually on tour uh, just before COVID hit. We were actually in Barcelona. It was like, you know, our very last gig <laughs> before yeah, we all went into <laughs> yeah. sort of thing. I, so, like, I always knew you were a musician, but I never knew the, the, uh, the, that background that you had, like, a couple of albums. And yeah. you, know, you were actually very prolific as an artist was yeah let's just try to see whatever I can do from that now it, just, it feels a little interesting because you mentioned creativity and during COVID because I didn't have that performative you know outlet yep. I felt like I couldn't compose anything new for some weird reason right um but then yeah I don't know I then went off into nature and we were talking about going to Tenerife right <laughs> <laughs> um and the music started coming back and you know I'm excited to bring new things to the table now um, yeah yeah I I went to I was really 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 lucky a few years ago to go on the very first Biennale to Antarctica um, and that was like insane um you know it, it really had a transformative effect on me um and very much I'm figuring out how to kind of embody this in the next sort of bit of work I'm going to be doing yep. um related to environments you know so yeah wow yeah <laughs> that sounds cool yeah so um so let's flip the tangent in a different direction mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> Why not? Why not? <laughs> is that racist? No, it's not. Um, <laughs> it's not. It's an observation. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so, NeuroCreate. Mm -hmm. Let's yep. talk about NeuroCreate. NeuroCreate. Yeah, yeah. So, that's my startup. Basically, uh, in my PhD, I ended up finding the signature brain pattern for when people, well, when the performers were in the creative flow state. Yep. So, that's basically certain areas of the brain and also certain types of activation or deactivation in the brain. Yep. Um, as related to when people were objectively performing more creatively. So objectively assessed by other professional musicians and also, um, you know, academics like professors and conservatoires or whatever it is. Yep. And then, you know, fast forward a couple of years, I've been doing this sort of, um, well, I've been doing this creative production company throughout um, university, which is trying to bring together arts and sciences through the sort of modicum of performance and workshops and experiences. Yep. And so I'd learned a thing or two about what kind of, you know, what works in practice about, well, the dialogue between interdisciplinary sort of, you know, well, between disciplines, let's just say that interdisciplinary dialogue in itself, yep. but also creativity and how can we bring in that sort of neuroscience or, you know, scientific knowledge um, while still engaging something playful, right? And actually training your creativity maybe, or like discovering your creativity and or maintaining your creativity. And then I kind of went, right, let's look at the state of AI right now. 
it feels like I could digitize. And you mentioned digitizing, right? Right at the beginning. Um, All my learnings into, you know, a platform that enables people to get to that flow state by creativity. Yep. And so I was like, cool, how do we do this? (laughs) No, everybody's a musician. And of course, flow states have also been related to like athletes and things like that. But I thought, okay, you know what? Most people are digital, right? They're at their desks. They're knowledge workers, right? What can we do that can reach the most numbers of people? Yep. And I thought, actually, most people converse, right? And, and so I thought, why not create a brainstorming tool that is actually interactive and powered by AI to help you, you know, in your creative process? It sparks new ideas for you, uh, helps you sort of synthesize, you know, ideas into different sort of shapes, um, helps you kind of look at things from lots of different angles. And it's essentially like an interactive mind map. So literally helps you visualize what you've got inside. Yep externally in a more explicit sort of way look at your assumptions that you have around a particular topic break them down right and then put them back together in innovative sort of ways and and essentially it's 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 something that can help you in the conceptualization phase of an idea right so that could be for a new strategy for say a brand um it could be the brand values it could be branding itself it could be marketing it could be communication it could also be like you know creating a new character for a game it could be designing a new event like this like you know that we're in right now um, and also, if you're designing a new product, it can help you kind of interrogate, well, who is this for? You know, where does it come into the user journey? But it's all storytelling. And it's yep. essentially digitizing storytelling, but in a way that's really human-centered. Yeah, yeah. So the AI is there to help you, not not do the work for you, if that makes sense. So, so that's yeah. fascinating. Um, and it's, I mean, it's so, so in-depth. I mean, it's, it's crazy just listening to you talk about it, because you've, you've spoken to me about it before, but actually hearing you uh, break it down it's very interesting um where does someone a musician yeah start with something like that got this fantastic concept yeah you've started to build it i know you've raised raised money yeah Um, yeah yeah. it's starting to become uh you're on that cusp of becoming scalable where does someone like you a creative who's working with something like that that's very different to basically uh come from where do you start well, okay, so we, we, we have a version that has been um, as functional, basically. It's been used by many, many freelancers, including, you know, script writers and songwriters, uh, but also creative industries, so companies at agencies or, you know. Yep. Um, and we're now, we've just got an Innovate UK grant, basically, where we're basically trying to, as you say, make it more scalable. So if you've ever used Miro, um, I hope Miro's not listening to this and think I'm a competitor, but anyway, if you've <laughs> ever used Miro and Google Docs, so think Miro and Google Docs, which is this sort of mind mapping and it's collaborative for multiple people, um, but turbocharged with AI, right? And it's got these really specific goals of content creation, strategy, design thinking. So, you know, if I'm, if I'm a, a songwriter, I would be able to already use it, right, um, on my own, say, yep. and be like, okay, so for example, um, I typed in one of my own sort of lyrics, you know, last night I saw my love float out on the lake, right? <laughs> <laughs> and what it would do is then really like kind of flesh out what I mean by, you know, things related to lake and float and love and all that sort of stuff and come up with more poetic sort of... Um, maybe uh, say stanzas for example um, or kind of come up with what, who's the character in my song or what is the sort of story arc in my song um, from the lyric writing sort of perspective yep. um, but then you know now that it's kind of you know being put on the web and trying to be more sort of collaborative maybe as a songwriter's crew or group that could be quite useful you know and um, say you know for, for like I think I know a lot of publishing houses kind of do songwriting camps and things like yep. that you know so it's quite useful for collaborative writing or will be anyway <laughs> Um, and, 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 and going further beyond, say, um, songwriting, really useful for the hybrid mode of working that we are all seeing around us Absolutely. now. Absolutely. And, you know? like, it's a real struggle um, when, you're, um, uh, when you're collaborating in a creative environment, whether it's music or fashion or whatever, yeah. to kind of um, consolidate all of that, uh, all of the ideas and thoughts, and, um, et cetera, into one space. So, so I, I totally get that. And I'm, I'm, from speaking from experience as a musician, majority of stuff that we work on is all in our heads. Yeah. And oh, we, yeah. we all kind of know 
but it's it's never kind of put somewhere. So and not I, as I, explicit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I see the, the value in that. Absolutely. And, and also you mentioned, you know, maybe it's, it's a big jump, say, between, say, music and, you know, maybe being more broadly applicable. But actually, you know, I'm, I also come from an acting background, right? And, you know, a lot of this inspiration comes from improvising mm. within, act, you know, within acting and or devising a new show. Like, you're, yeah, exactly. You're a comedian. You know exactly yeah, what I'm talking yeah. about, right? Impro for life. Yeah. Probably. I love it. Yeah, exactly. Mm. And, and, you know, there's, it's, it's that stuff that happens in the moment that's super exciting and interesting and you really trust in the process and the truth that kind of arrives in, you know, in this space. Yep. Um, and so I thought, okay, improvising with another human, that's amazing. But if you don't have that chance, right, can you improv with the AI, yep. basically? And it's like your, you know, little buddy, you know, your little buddy creative collaborator in your pocket, right? Why not, right? Um, acting is not new to the world of, you know, storytelling, right? Within corporates, within like, you know, industry, you know, it's all about storytelling. It's all about, you know, being able to like convey your idea. Yeah. Right? And inspire your audience. Exactly. And actually ideas and innovation are the bloodline of, of how we're going to carry on with anything that we're seeing around us today yep. even, right? And so, you know, I think it's becoming less of a, let's just think about creativity as an artistic thing or like people or actors and silly hats, but rather it's super critical to the commercial world as well. Well, you just touched on something really important, commercial world. So those of you that aren't at ISC right now, obviously you can hear the commotion in the background. There's a lot of money here and it's specific to the creative industries, you know, um, if you look at some of the things that are here, I mean, I've been to like car shows that, are f that have like millions and millions of pounds spent just on LED. Yeah. Literally, there's like a yeah. whole LED and you're like, where, where is that money coming from? And the reality is um, creativity, um, if, if, you're, if you're savvy enough, you can figure out where the commercial aspect of um, being creative is. Because a lot, yeah. uh, I don't want to say a lot of people, but you know, you and I come from, um, Asian communities yeah. and you know like our families <laughs> just want us to be doctor exactly. you know, lawyer or you know like yeah. they, they don't see generally speaking they don't see creativity as a way to mm. make money yeah. and yeah. now more than ever mm. it's so great you know yeah. the creative space is so great you can you can you can earn a lot of money being creative um, and understanding that and bringing something like this to that space is so important yeah i mean we've all heard of adobe right yeah yeah yeah, yeah exactly yeah. Uh -huh. and, yeah. <laughs> and and they did this little study on you know on their industry basically just created the creative industries and found that creative companies outperformed others in terms of like market share revenue growth talent acquisition and retention yep. all sorts of things like that but also the institute for advertising essentially did a little thing where they basically found that um companies who did adverts uh which were actually creatively awarded had a greater something like a 10 to 1 share of voice efficiency right which, you know, basically means I say something and it gets amplified 10 times more. Um, and therefore that, low, you know, literally translates to more revenue. So, so that sort of thing is kind of hard to ignore, right? Yeah. And I mean, you touched on Adobe. I mean, like they make so much money. I think what yeah. they're in the, in the top five, like most, most profitable businesses in the world or something. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, and people use their stuff, you know, to make film, to, you know, to edit pictures, to be creative. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's the thing as well. I think Nesta did some sort of study on like, you know, there's this big um, fear, right, about creativity and technology and yeah. specifically AI, for example, right? Yeah. And they did the study and they actually found that, you know, computerizability, that's actually a term, um, um, increased people's abilities um, within the creative sphere. So technology actually increases people's creative abilities and skills and what they can actually do. So, you know, Adobe is a really great example of that yep. it's like you cannot do by hand what adobe allows you to do right exactly yeah yeah. that's the thing so and and we can see that today here with all the tech around us right the yep. av tech i mean yeah I, I literally walked on some sort of like japanese water pool projection thing and like, <laughs> it was incredible it was just like wow like bendy leds and screens yeah and, yeah i mean it's it's really great to to be here actually um so to, those of you listening to give you a bit of background isc has been going on for for decades mm -hmm. um it's it's the largest kind of consumer uh well business to business consumer electronics fair in the world or in europe mm. um i think ces is probably bigger yeah uh, but this i mean it's massive and 
if you're if you're a, a, a creative, it's yeah. an opportunity for you to kind of see where your creativity can take you. Yeah, yeah. yeah all yeah, the yeah. platforms are here. Yeah, it's all creative tech. I would say it's not you know it's not like a toaster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, it, yeah. I mean, it's it's an AV, which an yeah. audio visual. Um, uh, trade event. Yeah. That's what it is. Yeah. What it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's great. I mean, um, you know, we're, we're, be, we're being very looked after by ISE here yeah. at the Influencers Lounge. So I just want to do a big shout out to the team. Um, the guy that's working catering, Fabio, has been wonderful. <laughs> Bless him. Like, I, I came in this morning and he looked like he, he'd been partying all night. Yeah. But he's the most attentive dude ever. Like, whenever my coffee runs out, I just kind of look over my shoulder and he's there with a new one. <laughs> Seriously, he's like a ninja. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> I was on a call and I think, yeah, they'd given me some popcorn and he just kept checking. Oh, yeah. no, you're already at your lower third. I'm going to fill that up. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Big love to Fabio. And also Jessica and her team yes, as well for organizers. They've been, they've been brilliant. Um, so... Let's talk about um, your roots. Ooh. So you're from Bangladesh. I am. Yeah, yeah. So talk about that. Like, where were you born? Yeah. Like, where did you grow up? I know um, you've kind of travelled around a bit. Yeah, I feel okay. <laughs> so actually, when people ask me what kind of music I do, I'm like, you know what? The best way to describe it is third culture kid um, <laughs> living in London or London, right? Um, but I was born in United Arab Emirates, um, ah, and didn't know that. yeah, there's a lot of Asians there. You know, um, yep. a lot of you know the Bengali contingency, also the Filipino contingency. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Sindhi contingency like there's a lot of people there in, in UAE um, and, and so I grew up with a whole international melange of people um, hence your accent yeah usually it's, I find um, international students from that region have a very similar kind of accent yeah they do and similar kind of like uh, humor as well and it doesn't yeah. matter if it's from UAE or India or Singapore we're all like ah, <laughs> you're the weird kid right <laughs> like, yeah and um, but yeah there were like people there from all over the world you know whose parents came to UAE um, and you know my best friend was Australian um, you know, there are loads of Canadians there and da da da. But, you know, they come for a short period of time. Um, we didn't get like citizenship because we're not Arabs, say. Eh? Yeah. And so then we had to leave. So it's you quite know. transitional, isn't it? I've it's heard. Very, yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and so you were born there and grew up there? Yeah, until I was about 15 or so, 15 okay. or so. And then, and then I came to the, to the UK. Um, and I was. London in, uh, specifically? No, in Kent, actually. Oh, my. Uh, yeah. Mm. Anyway, <laughs> for like about three <laughs> <That's> years. <right. laughs> Yeah, I mean, Garden of England and everything, but this is a little bit. Mm. <laughs> and then, and then London, basically. Yeah, exactly. So London for, for a good long time. So I definitely am a Londoner um, now. But yeah, it, there was definitely a bit of a, you know, uh, when people go, like, "Where are you from?" I'd have to say this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this entire time. Now I just go UK, <laughs> London. <laughs> so I mean, you you yeah. consider yourself a Brit. I consider myself a Londoner, but yeah, yeah, yeah. A Brit, yeah, I would say so. Yeah. And then uh, you, you just recently moved to Berlin. Yes, is that right? yeah, yeah. And that was kind of um, within pandemic. Um, it was slightly fueled, in fact, probably majorly fueled by Brexit uh, because I, as you've probably seen, a pretty internationally minded. I really don't believe in borders. It was kind of a very yep. maybe um, emotional thing because I was just like, wait, what? I'm not going to be allowed to like, you know, move yeah, across we, borders. Yeah, we had a chat about this last night, didn't we? Yeah, yeah. Um, and actually what it would have meant for artists specifically or freelancers in general. So like, you know, um, musicians going over for like, say, one gig or whatever, um, you know, you'd have to pay carne for every single bit of yeah, equipment you've got. It's, it's kind of like a, a a, a logistic, a paperwork logistic nightmare. Yeah, now. and you'd need like a, a permit and like a, some sort of sponsorship from the venue and like, you know, a visa that's different. And you're like, well, who's going to do that? Yeah. You know? well, uh, yeah. I, I don't know. Like, uh, uh, so I'm with you. I'm, yeah. I was really against Brexit. Yeah. Um, and it's happened now. Yeah. And then COVID happened. So it was kind of like... Uh, Double whammy. Like, what's going on? Yeah. Um, I, I haven't had any issues mm. uh, performing abroad. And when I say I haven't had any issues, okay. It, okay. It, 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 you could still perform abroad, but it's just the logistics of mm. it. Like, and uh, I'm a bit, I'm a bit of a nasty person in that I kind of let the promoter handle it. I'm like, oh, well done. That, that's your, <laughs> that's your job. And they're like, <laughs> oh God, another thing I'm gonna sign up. <laughs> You're on another level. You. That's great. <laughs> um, but, but, um, you know, there are artists who. You know, the promoter won't. They're like, no. You, if you, you want to, if you want to play here, you've got to yeah, do yeah, your thing. Exactly. And it's but, really frustrating. It's like the states, you know, it's all been been quite hard for the UK people to go over to the states, right? Yeah. Um, and not so hard for them to come and play in yeah. the UK. But so then I thought, okay, that. And then I was just like, okay, you know, borders and stuff. And I don't know. It's kind of emotional. So I was just and like, Germany's you know, wicked. I love yeah, Germany. Yeah. And I was like, okay, why not? You know, there's meant to be artists and community and all that in Berlin and stuff. So, but I must say, like, you know, I went over there, and because of COVID, it was locked down in most places, right? 
um, I feel it's only now that it's beginning to open up. You know, you can feel the energy and the yep. rhythm of a city. It takes a little bit of time. How long, how long have you been there? I moved over like uh, September 2020, but okay. a lot of a lot of back and forth. But um, yeah, I just thought, you know what? I'm seeing most of my friends like on Zoom calls. Um, I might as well do it from another country and you know check it out and see what's yeah. going on. And <laughs> do it before the transition periods, and you know. So like, because a lot of my friends are European and they live in the UK, so they have the capacity to to have both, yeah. right? And the leave to remain. I didn't. I only have you know the British passport and the British citizenship, which used to be a great thing. <laughs> <laughs> You know, um, and then and then was kind of limiting. So I was like, okay, cool. So this was kind of a way for me to, you know, also get a, a, an EU residency as well. Yeah. So yeah, no, I get it, I yeah. get it. And um, how are you finding German life? Is it very different to the UK? I was thinking that. Yeah, the very first thing I kind of noticed is that like everything shuts down on a Sunday. It yep. is unheard of. Yeah, in yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? I was like, what is this? This is insane. You know? I was like, how dare you get me to stop? <laughs> you know, um, and, and you know, have to do your chores, basically, or whatever it is on a Saturday, right? <laughs> but probably going out clubbing all night, and then, you know, off you go, get your eggs, you know, <laughs> that sort of thing. So that's one thing that I think that, you know, hit me first. But, you know, it is generally um, maybe a more chilled sort of, you know, yeah, pace yeah, of yeah. life. Um, I live in a part of Berlin that has a lot of cobblestones and it has a lot of green ivy and things like that, which wow. I like, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, all of London's obviously the greenest, you know, whatever, in the in capital in, in, in Europe. I, I think I have this, like, which one's better sort of pull in me right now. I'm not yeah. quite sure. There, there's yeah. a really strong creative community, though, in Berlin and a tech yeah. community as well. It's obviously mm. not as big as the UK, but it's very, it, it's very vibrant. Yeah. There's lots of, like, funding, yeah. lots of grants and stuff. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, so it's, yeah. it's, it's kind of, I think it's an exciting time. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. For that region and I for sure. think um, Germany is something like the fifth largest in, in, in the world in terms right, of you know, okay. its market. But AI, you know, since, you know, that thing that we won't mention again, yeah. AI, you know, UK was, was the, the proponents basically um, within AI, but now in the EU, it's Germany. So that's kind of interesting. Yeah. Me, yeah. As a tech entrepreneur. So you're yeah. going to stay? Uh, at least until September. So we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, I think a, a lot of back and forth at least. So. Nice, yeah. nice. Yeah. So um, let's talk a little bit about you. Um, you, you touched on um, acting. You never yeah. told me that no, you used to be an actor. So <laughs> talk, talk to us about your acting history. Yeah. Um, hmm. Well, okay, I was always doing it. Um, and then I got into physical theater and improv um, quite a Quite in in the UAE depth. or in the UK? Uh, well, doing it in the UAE as part of, you know, school stuff, etc. Yep. But then got kind of more in-depth into it um, uh, in, in the UK. Uh, so, so a lot of sort of Eastern European, like, physical theater groups going, going wow. over, um, like, you know, the Grotowski sort of angle of things and Guide Nietzsche and Song of the Goat and that sort of thing. Yep. Very interested because uh, there was, a, and still is, an amazing theater company called Complicite, which I was really, you know, inspired by in terms of bringing together arts and science is. Yep. Right. So they did this amazing um, show called A Disappearing Number. Um, and I guess through through all of that sort of evolution, <clears throat> excuse me, um, you know, that's how the art science uh, theater company Jugular came about, essentially. Um, and in the process, one of my friends was like, hey, do you want to come and, um, you know, audition for, for this thing that I've been trying to cast, but we just can't find the right person. I was like, eh, I'll do it. Right. Uh, <laughs> went over. Um, and they're like, that's great. Can you come in for like, you know, the, the, the second sort of audition? I was like, oh, I don't know. I have to move around my, you know, my candidate, my, my P, you know, I was doing my PhD sort of EEG recording. I was like, I don't know. I have to like rebook my subjects. I don't know if I could do that. And they're like, you do realize that, you know, you just be given the chance to, <laughs> to, to audition for like a worldwide BBC drama series. Wow. What was it? So, in the end, uh, it's called Bishash, uh, and... <laughs> I think you told me about it actually a while ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, it's, it, it was a bilingual uh, BBC drama series. It was shot in England and in Bangladesh. It oh. roughly translates to faith or to believe. Yep. And it was basically a mix between X-Files, Scooby-Doo, and Buffy <laughs> the Vampire Slayer. <laughs> How, how long were you on that for? So, yeah, I was the lead, yo. And it was like... You've never told me about this. <laughs> yeah. That sounds amazing. It was like Southeast Asia's first supernatural detective thriller. Oh, my oh, God. No, exactly. <laughs> but it was cool. Yeah, it was really, really fun. Um, Is that on your IMDb and everything? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah. It's a 24-part series. Um, and, yeah, so I was basically out in, in, in Bangladesh for a while. When did um, that finish? This. 
Ooh, it's been a while. Um, do you know what? This is, this is again, my age uh, shows. Like, you know, this little Facebook group popped up, you know, like in memoriam of fangirling, essentially. <laughs> um, uh, it's commemorating the 10 year anniversary of that. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I still get lovely, cute little messages. Yeah, I bet. You know? <laughs> I bet. I mean, so did you, yeah. uh, after that finished, did you con- consciously want to stay within the acting space or did you sidestep out like what yeah it was interesting because I was like okay I don't want to be well it was quite difficult because I was actually in the middle of my PhD whilst I was you know um yeah literally they were like you got the part I was like oh great (laughs) right and they're like you don't sound too thrilled I was like well I don't know what I'm gonna say to my PhD supervisors right so for a while I tried to do the two together and then I had to have like an official break so then I had to go back and finish it so that was one angle um and the other thing was you know it's it's a series so you're really you're locked in for a long time yeah you you can't you can't exactly exactly so then I was like "Mm, I'm not sure I want to do a series again but I'd be totally into movies you know and I'd be into like theater um you know as and when sort of thing um and yeah it has been you know short sort of episodes maybe here and there has been more theater I didn't have an agent then right um and I didn't have an agent for a while because again they would be like right you know drop everything go to the audition now you know Mm. and I'm like uh I do have another life which is you know PhD in music and my own sort of stuff right yeah but then during lockdown I got approached by an agent um, completely randomly no idea why um and so it's become more of a conscious thing now um to re-enter, if that makes sense. Awesome. So, well, it's, yeah. it's, it's good that you said, so you know you know, I'm an actor, obviously. Yeah, yeah. I can see that. <laughs> Do you see my recent uh, thing? Uh, what? what? I'm, in, I'm in Doctor Strange 2. What? It came out last weekend. Oh yeah, my yeah, yeah. God, that's so, incredible. So like my DMs have just been going crazy. Oh my God. But, but just like you, yeah. I've had to balance a lot of things. Yeah. You know, mm. My music, my career, like yeah. those sorts of things. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, uh, you know, I love acting. Yeah. I, I absolutely adore it. There's nothing like it, but it's, it's a very hard space yeah. to be in, just like yeah. any creative space. Yeah. Um, a couple of questions I want to ask you. Yeah. The first one, so you've, you've answered a lot actually, but the first one is um, with regards to your improvising. Yeah. So I, you know, I'm, I'm an improviser. Yeah, stage, yeah. I do stand up comedy. I, I use it when I'm acting, but I also use it in my everyday. Mm. I find it very useful from a, you know, as a business person when I'm yeah, working yeah, yeah. clients, talking to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Being being an improviser is, a, I believe, is a really strong tool. Yeah. Do, do you? Yeah, use yeah, it? yeah. I think I do it without realizing it for right. sure. Right. It's all about what they call adaptability or cognitive flexibility, which is a fancy term for <laughs> basically being able to think on your feet. But yep. actually, it's uh, you touched upon it before. It is I think so. This is the, the whole thesis of what we're doing in Neuro Create is like through helping you with your cognitive flexibility, we're actually helping great to well-being yep. um, and health. And we've always known, like, you know, arts therapy and well-being, right? And now we're kind of, what I'm trying to kind of shed light on is a cognitive functionality. Like, why? Why arts and therapy, you know? Mm. Um, why being creative and well-being? You know, there is this thing about flexibility. Um, and that flexibility leads to resilience to stress, in my opinion. Yep. And, you know, there's this kind of, Amazing. you know, yeah. definition of stress, which is uh, arising from being quite fixed in your approach to something essentially like stressing yourself out you're like wigging out about something because you're like I don't see any other way Mm. right and then actually there's always another way and and this is what this cognitive flexibility is all about and I think you know essentially if you can have a daily flow practice which you know in your case it sounds like improv yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and what I'm kind of trying to do but through digitization is also improv yep um I think you you're in a good place you know um it's a good brain workout it's helping you against stress. Um, and surely that leads to better well-being, you know? You Absolutely. feel happier, no? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I was reading, um, there was an article in the BBC recently about um, the history of comedy. Ooh. And there was, the, you know, they were talking about like how uh, some of the most... Uh, connecting jokes of today have been around for like four like thousands of years, yeah. thousands of years. I, think it was, I think it was about really? four thousand like years like Plato <laughs> if, check out the um, oh, check wow. out the article if you just type yeah, in yeah. BBC uh, history of comedy yeah something yeah. like okay, that it's, okay. it's a really cool article wow. but one of the things it was talking about was how comedy is so important in society because yeah. um, as you say it like it, it eases a lot of pressures yeah. and mental pressures yeah. but um, it also means that you can um, you know if, if you've got a friend who's funny they'll they'll help you to yeah. to get through life like in a in a, in a nicer way yeah, I think um, so. and vice yeah, versa yeah. as well and apparently people who are funny are likable yeah. you know uh, 
people who surround themselves with funny people have a, 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 a kind of longer life. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's actually a really important mm. part of um, just social connection. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, play in general, right? So mm. that cognitive flexibility or improv is all underpinning play. But you also mentioned like just the action of funny and experiencing funny means you laugh. Yep. Right. And laugh itself apparently releases a ton of good, you know, hormones yeah. and things like that. Hell right. Yeah, hell yeah. Aren't there like laughing clubs or you're just meant to just laugh at anything without it being funny? <laughs> yes. Yeah. So in, yeah. I don't know if yeah. you've ever been to in Mumbai. Mm. They have, I think it's on Sunday mornings. They have a laughing morning. There you go. And you just literally stand in a circle and just laugh. And it's the weirdest thing I've ever I seen know, in my right? life. I know, right? It's so God. cool. Yeah, I think I saw it once on a tube. Yeah, yeah. like literally people came on and went, <laughs> like, okay, right? I, I mean, I, I love group hysterics. I don't know what it is. Whenever I'm with <laughs> like a group of friends and then someone laughs and then you laugh and then it yeah, all just... Yeah, it's it, like group yawning. It's, it's wonderful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's very like relaxing. Yeah. It like, relieves a lot of pressure. Yeah, but I think what's also really interesting, you just mentioned if you have a friend who's funny, I think, why are they funny? Why is something funny? You know, if you actually look at the mechanics of it, right? It's mm. just, sorry, there's me again no, yeah, the no, mechanics good. are funny I mean it doesn't sound that funny or, or interesting but <laughs> I think it's because um, somebody just helped you flip a paradigm yep and you, and the shock of it makes you laugh you yeah, say, yeah oh okay yeah. whoa I never saw that <laughs> like you know and, and I think that that in itself is creativity like by definition let's say mm. you know something that's different something that's a new kind of way of looking at things absolutely absolutely um, so we, we've got about 10 minutes left what? That yeah, went yeah. really fast. It went really fast. Yeah, yeah but we have we, a friend we, who's funny. <laughs> <laughs> but we still got some time. Um, I want to ask you a few more questions. Yeah. Um, first one, this is a deep question. If you could give some advice yeah. to a younger version of, your, of yourself as she was coming into uh, becoming a professional, um, what, would you, what would you say? Hmm. I would say believe in yourself more. Because uh, I think at the time and even now, sometimes I'm like, whoa, I'm finding myself in really cool, curious, interesting situations. And maybe I don't stay in the present or appreciate enough uh, that these are amazing opportunities that I need to take with both hands and feet <laughs> <laughs> and heart and mind, you know. Um, so, yeah, believe in yourself and, and really believe in the future projection of yourself that you want to be as well uh, and, and really map that out. Because um, I think that would have helped maybe stick to something for longer, maybe, or, you know, take it to different heights, maybe. Still not over. I'm talking to myself now, really. <laughs> but, like, but, yeah, I think that, that sort of believe in yourself, but also... Um, you know, in, in some ways, uh, I think that the seeds have always been planted. So, you know, it's about having faith in those things growing and taking them, you know, life taking its own course in a way that's, that's good and beneficial, Yeah. you know, to everyone around you, including you, right? So let, let's talk about that because um, a lot of the people that I speak to say similar things, not the same, but similar things okay. like, mm. um, you know, have you know don't don't worry about stuff um be confident in your conviction yeah you know yeah. um uh, if, if you have a volition be like just just kind of just like go with it yeah you know, just just own it mm. um what do you think is the problem when mm. you're a younger person why do you worry because mm. i think it's an interesting question i think there's a whole bunch of things in that right um a lot of people go you know um the 20s were like horrible uh because i guess you're working yourself out still you've left school sure but you're still working yourself out as a young person you know in the 30s you're kind of like oh i think i kind of worked it out you know these, these are the new 20s you know blah 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 right <laughs> and and so you then maybe through through actual practice at life you kind of go okay it's it's better i can see how it works you know so i think there's an element of trying to figure yourself out there yep. But, you know, back in my day, um, <laughs> it was way more siloed, you know? So me, I, I have crossed a lot of disciplines, right? You yep. too, right? Yep. It wasn't a done thing. I think it's becoming more of a done thing now. I'll give you a high five on that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I agree with you. It was really difficult because, you know, I just gave you an example of like, I was trying to do 14 hour filming days whilst holding down a PhD <laughs> because people didn't understand, didn't accept it and, and were not cool with it, right? Yeah. Uh, in the end, I was like, I'm really sorry if you're not cool with it, but I'm having a sabbatical break and that's that right and I had to do things very much apologetically in a way yeah. right uh, you which know. isn't fair 
right? Ask for forgiveness afterwards, yeah. <laughs> you know? But, you know, I was like, okay, cool. Why can't I do two things at the same time? I'm, 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 I'm due to do those two things at the same time because I have the ability to do it. I have yeah. a natural whatever, you yeah. know, propensity, and I'm, I'm con- contributing to science. And, as you know, acting is something that, that is there naturally, right? Yeah. So why, why shouldn't I do that kind of thing? Mm. But it's very much like asking for permission, asking to, you know, so I think that must have had an effect on, you know, on am I allowed to do this? Should I be doing this? What is interdisciplinarity? Yep. Uh, what am I? You know, what is this identity thing? You know, yeah. <laughs> all of that sort of thing, you know, comes into play. And then obviously, you know, as any wonderful PhD student will tell you, there is the imposter syndrome when it comes to like, you know, science yep. uh, and, and academia in and of itself. You're like, wow, am I, am I allowed to be an expert in this? <laughs> you know, and yet you are. You're the only expert in this, you know. You're, exactly. you're, you're more so than the professor who's got a ton of other, you know, PhD students in it. And he's not an expert in any of those things. Or she is not an expert in any of those things that you are in, you know. Mm. And you only figure this stuff out retrospectively. Yep. Um, so I think there's just a, a, a ton of things that contribute to, ooh, am I doing the right thing? Is that kind of constant sort of questioning? Mm. Um, and maybe that doubt and that uncertainty, which I'm sure, you know, a lot of people have felt during COVID as well, right? Yeah. And, uh, what am I doing in my life? <laughs> you know? yeah. Am I being furloughed? Have I got any money coming in, you know, um, as a performer, as a freelancer? You know, there's a lot of stuff about what's next, you know, uh, is life going to go back to normal? Those kinds of uncertainties also kind of, I think, impact upon the confidence you yep. know? Or, or, or having the faith in yourself. Yeah, kind of thing. yeah. Um, not to say you shouldn't worry about it. You know, you know, the person didn't worry about the lion um, got eaten, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but there's a healthy amount of like strategizing, I think, that, that, that would stand you in good stead without then tipping into anxiety. Yep. But that's super difficult, right? Um, we have brains that like to ruminate. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, like, um, like I've, I've had to struggle with that as well. Um, over the years and I I do feel as you get older you kind of you you learn to control it yeah that's it it still happens yeah um, yeah but you learn to control it and you you learn to rationalize it and I think when you're younger the balance is 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 against you Mm. mentally Mm. you just you just kind of just fall into this trap of uh like imposter syndrome but also like uh am I allowed to do this? Mm. I want to do this, but am I allowed, you know? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think maybe people in positions of authority have something to do as well and they tend to be older than you and all that sort of absolutely, stuff. Absolutely, yeah. You know? Uh, but then, you know, when you find good mentors and good coaches, exactly. yeah. Um, yeah. that helps you. I mean, I, I, like I remember just being in difficult situations with regards to my choices mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, people around me telling me I'm not allowed to do that. Yeah, yeah. But then someone saying, no, you are. Like, yeah, it's good yeah. to... That, why not? To do that, to you do know? this adventure. Absolutely, um, yeah. And that's the other thing. Yeah, am I allowed to go on an adventure to Antarctica? Yes. Yeah. Uh, hello? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's like, what? Yeah, what, really? <laughs> um, but touch on another thing you said mental right so uh we have a lot of neuroplasticity going on yep. you know we i mean love it exactly that <laughs> i have to bring it back to that i yeah, love it you know there's some research that shows you know we have some sort of reorganization happening in our brains like roughly around 18 21 you know and roughly again around 26 27 right i just, know that yeah just kind of interesting because you know there's that whole musicians 27 club right mm-hmm. yeah i mean i've often thought about this you know i haven't put the two together in a formal way but yeah. hey if you're kind of reorganizing your brain Brain, literally, you know, it's kind of a delicate time. And I think, you know, um, yeah, parents are even advised now to be kind of delicate around, you know, their children at 18 to 21, right? They're really trying to figure things out. Mm. Um, what stays, what goes, new ideas, new identity, like, you know, and, and, and your, 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 your brain has really got this capacity, like to grow, you know, neuroplasticity for learning, it's like super sensitive, right? Mm. And, and, and people say you're getting your, you know, your best mathematical thoughts, Right. You know, Newton did it at 21. That's it. Right. Yeah, yeah. You haven't received it by 24, the download or whatever it is. <laughs> you know, you're not going to get that Fields medal. Right. Yeah. So there's a lot of stuff happening. And now we've got working memory problems. Right. Yeah. And probably that's why we're being a little bit more stable. You know, we're not being as reactive to stimulation, mm. maybe as as when we are in our 20s, you know. Absolutely. And, and I do feel um, you, I mean, you talked about it like there's a lot of pressure at that age. Yeah. But I, like now I know like like I'm in my, I'm, I'm coming up to my mid 40s yeah but I like I feel like I'm I'm having the, the most creative most fruitful moment nice. in my life I mean it's, it's wow not, it's that's not, awesome it's not like it's been yeah. like awful before it's, it's always yeah. been creative but it, it just feels like it's getting better and better yeah and you're I like think, realizing yourself yeah more. and, I, and yeah. I think if there's yeah. any young people listening to this yeah. now yeah. Who, are, who are worried like 
j- just be assured that life just gets so much better. As long, I mean, you have to work hard. You, you do have to work hard. And I think maybe that's part of what we're doing now. It's not entirely resting on our laurels, but we've kind of proven ourselves. Yeah. Or we've, we've, you know, but that's the point. That's kind of problematic because if in your 20s, you're having to prove yourself at the same time as you know, all the things we just mentioned. It just has a double whammy. Absolutely. Or a triple whammy. Um, Absolutely. But that's a good body of work, yeah. right? And that's what's helping us now, yeah. in a sense. So, um, Shama, we're starting to run out of time, and I can yeah. feel, um, <laughs> is it Graham? Yeah, Graham uh, is using this booth after me. Is, okay. Uh, I can feel his eyes burning through this wall. <laughs> um, like a superhero. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, look, I know loads of people have got a lot of value out of this conversation. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for, for your honesty, yeah. your... your um, your uh, bravery actually um, and your humility oh, thank uh, which you. is really good um, <laughs> there's going to be some people that want to get in contact with yeah, you yeah 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 how's the best way for them to get in contact with well, you well um, socials uh, my full name is Shama Rahman um, S-H-A-M-A R-A-H-M-A-N but actually if you want to drop me an email or anything like that just you know flip my name rahman.shama at gmail.com okay if you want to check out NeuroCreate um, and the the mind mapping tool that I mentioned that's turbocharged by AI it's neurocreate.co.uk slash team or teams <laughs> one of the two um, I'll probably try to give it to Sanj and, and maybe it can be written in properly but yeah yeah so yeah, uh, yeah um, these notes are basically put on the podcast so okay wants to, but yeah if, if you're listening uh, the notes are in there but yeah if you heard that then uh, yeah and uh, if you like music check out Bandcamp so Shama Rahman Bandcamp.com and um, yeah there's an album on Spotify called Truth Be Told um, my artist name is Shama <laughs> awesome <laughs> easier awesome. to remember <laughs> <laughs> brilliant thanks so yeah. much yeah um, guys thank you so much for listening um, again please share um, don't forget the hashtag because we're doing this in partnership with IC. it's hashtag IC22 um, whatever you're doing wherever you are please be safe and but most importantly please be good Thank you.